It's always good to come home to Fayetteville Babe Ruth hit his first one Heard around the world Sherman marched with the Union And burned the arsenal Old Market House still standing But stands for freedom's will I'm talking about my hometown, Fayetteville Take long when you're away from home to find out how you feel. It's always good to come home to Fayetteville, my all American city, Fayetteville. Talking about my hometown, Fayetteville. Yeah, that's, he's not here tonight. I'm, I'm keeping it for him. Just turn it down over there. <laughs> you can tell we have people on the phone tonight. So. We'll call the uh, March the 12th Federal City Council meeting to order. Thank everyone for... Uh, Coming tonight, and we ask that you stand for our invocation, which is tonight led by Resident Iman Abdul Hanif. I hope he's here. And then, if you would remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance, tonight to be led by a Girl Scout from Troop 1481. Mr. Mayor, distinguished members of the Fayetteville City Council, and to all of you honorable people, let us pray. Our Creator, the merciful benefactor, the merciful Redeemer, who opens for all people a way to have good conscience and a good life, grant to this city that its honorable citizens live as a prosperous city, a city of many in one, and as a people of faith, taking pride in human decency, industry, and service. Bless the efforts of the mayor the city council, and all other efforts in progress for more jobs and more opportunity in the city of Fayetteville for more of us. Bless and grant increase for all our city leaders, the excellence of man's spirit, the excellence of intellect. Bless and strengthen them with wisdom, insight, and vision. Open their hearts to human compassion, tolerance, cooperation, and determined perseverance for justice and for what is right. Grant that all of us always cherish our freedom and the noble essence of the American people. Bless our homes, bless our schools, bless the parents, 
Bless our troubled youth, our burdened inner cities. Bless them to never be without hope or direction. Bless matrimony and families here and in all the world. With God's name, I'm in. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're missing Keith. Just to confirm, uh, Robert Massey and Katie Ann Davey are with us telephonically tonight. They're at the... National League of Cities Conference uh, in Washington. They're both online, is that correct? They're correct. Thank you very Katie much. Katie Ann and Mr. Massey, you're both online? Yes, we are. Thank you. The mass is online. Ms. Davey? Yes, I'm here. And Mr. Bates, okay, thanks. Okay, we'll begin uh, tonight with approval of tonight's agenda. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Thank you, Mr. Bates. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on the motion? May I ask for your vote, please? Mr. Massey? Affirmative. Affirmative. Ms. Davey? All right, thank you very much. That's uh, unanimous. Thank you, Council. I uh, have several important recognitions and have some Council members help me in this, please. Uh, first, we have a proclamation in honor of the Girl Scout Week, and we invite Girl Scout Troop Leader Gwen Barm and Girl Scout Troop 1481 Leader Cindy Rose to join Miss Applewhite. And I am a, I'm a former okay, formal Girl Scout Miss Applewhite. While they're walking to the front, let me share this with you. Uh, whereas March 12, 2012 marks the 100th anniversary of Girl Scouts of the USA, which began in 1912 when Juliet Gordon Lowe gathered 18 girls in Savannah, Georgia, to provide them the opportunity to develop physically, mentally, and spiritually. Whereas for 100 years, Girl Scouting has helped build millions of girls and women of courage, confidence, and character who act to make the world a better place. And whereas the Girl Scout Leadership Program helps girls discover themselves and their values, connect with others, and take action to make the world a better place. And whereas the Girl Scout Gold Award, the highest honor in Girl Scouting, requires girls to make a measurable and sustainable difference in their community and honors leadership in the Girl Scout tradition. And whereas through the dedication, time, and talent of thousands of volunteers of different backgrounds, abilities, and areas of expertise, the Girl Scout program is brought to more than 70,000 girls in grades K-12 across the state of North Carolina. Now, therefore, I, Anthony G. Schiavone, Mayor of the City of Fayetteville, and on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim March the 11th through the 17th, 2012, to be Girl Scout Week in our All-America City, and applaud the Girl Scouts for their 100 years of leadership, and salute them as they celebrate 100 years of Girl Scouting. We'd now like to recognize the American Red Cross and ask uh, Councilman Hurst to help me with this as Executive Director Victoria Raleigh and Board Member Susan Mills and Dr. Jonas Akega join us up front. Whereas the American Red Cross Highlands Chapter was established on April the 26, 1917 in response to a call from President Woodrow Wilson after the start of World War I to assist and comfort communities stricken by disasters and to help the able-bodied and disabled veterans and civilians overseas. And whereas the American Red Cross Highlands Chapter provides services to local military personnel and their families, including 24-7 emergency messaging, assisting military members and their families through pre-deployment and post-deployment briefings and seminars. And whereas the American Red Cross Highlands Chapter provides shelter, clothing, food, and counsel to hundreds of area families who experience a home fire or other disasters such as tornadoes and floods. 
And whereas each year the American Red Cross Highlands Chapter teaches thousands of local citizens to lead safer and healthier lives through life-saving skills training, and whereas annually the American Red Cross Highlands Chapter helps to collect, test, and distribute thousands of life-saving units of blood and blood products, now therefore Anthony G. Schiavone, Mayor of the City of Fayetteville, and on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim March 2012 to be American Red Cross Month in our All-America City and extend our appreciation to the dedicated individuals who keep this noble humanitarian mission alive and encourage our citizens to join in this observance. Thank you so much, Mayor. It's our, it's our privilege to um, work with everyone in this community, and so thank you for our, we wouldn't be able to do um, and provide our services without your continued support, you which means work. a lot. Thank great you. work. Ma'am, just one personal note. The council was talking in the last month the appropriate way to perhaps recognize the anniversary of the a tornado last April and, and the, how the community came together, but certainly we all know and appreciate and know that the Red Cross Highlands chapter was right at the heart of all that. So thank you for your efforts in that area. I think we have Ms. Roberta Waddle here with the National Organization of Women for a very special presentation. <coughs> Uh, I can't do it without Officer Sanders. I don't know if Officer Sanders is here. <laughs> I wonder if we might reschedule that. We certainly can do that, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay, we'll now move to recognition of the Cape Fear Grange. Councilman, oh, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Arp is going to help with that. <coughs> member, oh, Wade Fowler is a member of the organization. Well, great. And uh, receiving the certificate will be the North Carolina State Grange President, Jimmy Gentry. Is Mr. Gentry here? Come right up, sir. <coughs> so just in case you are not familiar with this organization, the Cape Fear Grange is a community-based nonprofit organization dedicated to making a positive difference in Cumming County. And some of their service projects to date include donations to Ferguson Easley Elementary School, donations to Pauline Jones Elementary School, they sponsored a Backpack for Kids program. That's one of Ms. Applewhite's favorites. A clothing drive benefiting Person Street United Methodist Church clothes closet. Canned food drives benefiting Second Harvest Food Bank of Southeastern North Carolina. Operation Inasmuch it provided scholarship to three students at the Grange Summer Camp and donated uh, monies to the Boys and Girls Club of Cumming County. Lit uh, literally an entire sheet of great worthwhile uh, efforts in our community. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council, and thank you to the citizens of Fayetteville. We're a small service organization group, and uh, anybody like information about us, please contact us uh, because our membership is growing and we need your help. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, uh, we're very proud of this Grange in, in, here in North Carolina. They're only about, they only were chartered about three years ago and they hit the ground running, and they're doing some wonderful things for the community here. We're very <coughs> proud of them. The guys in the brown church are the ones that should be up here rather than me. Thank you very much on their behalf. Thank you, sir. <laughs> we'll now move to item five, which is tonight's public forum. Uh, let me give you the details of how that process works. As you know, it's designed to invite citizen input and discussion. The forum shall last no longer than 15 minutes, and each speaker shall have up to two minutes to address council on issues related to the city of Fedville. When you see the light located on the podium change from green to yellow, that means there's approximately 30 seconds left of the two minutes. And when you see the timer located on the podium blink and change from yellow to red, that means the full two minutes has expired. When your <coughs> name is called, we ask that you come to the podium and state your name and address clearly for the record. Madam Clerk, we'll begin the public forum. Mayor, our first speaker tonight is Mr. Roosevelt Oden.
I want to focus on today is to get a permanent Fayetteville Regional Center for the deaf. I have learned that Fayetteville is one of the largest populations second only to the Triangle, which is Raleigh-Durham-Chapel Hill, and the Charlotte area. The Piedmont is also a large area. Greensboro, Winston-Salem, High Point, that area. And of course, there's one small area out in the west, in, out in the west in Morganton, um, where the deaf school is located. I've been working very closely with Charles Yates to, um, to make a, a local plan and to set up a policy so that we can hopefully get a Fayetteville Regional Center for Deaf Services for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. The reason I think we need this center is that Fayetteville has been um, a center <coughs> They have a center in Wilson, but it's rather small, and we have a large population here in Fayetteville. I, um, we started to work on it, and we're putting it on hold until September because I want to get the local community involved. I would like to have more deaf people come. They're kind of shy, and they're a little intimidated by all the people and cameras, so I'm going to work on that for the regional center and hopefully we can get a lot of local involvement so we can educate the state to let them know that we need this center here in Fayetteville. My final thing I want to say is um, that I want to encourage people to not be afraid even though I have an interpreter here you can still talk to me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Hey. Thanks for coming. Sir. So our next speaker is Ms. Deborah Godwin. <clears throat> mayor Shivani. Mayor Godwin. And Fayetteville City Council. As mayor, I bring you greetings from our proud citizens of Godwin. On behalf of the Board of Commissioners for the Town of Godwin, I extend a sincere thank you for your support of Godwin's recent park project. Funded by North Carolina Parks and Trust Fund matching 50-50 grant along with Cumberland County and the town of Godwin, the park is complete now and an official ribbon cutting is scheduled. Recognition goes to City Council member Katie Ann Davey for her role as liaison to Fayetteville Cumberland Parks and Recreation and to Michael Gibson, Director of Parks and Recreation. I personally want to thank Karen Brady and Wayne Mosier who worked extremely hard on the Godwin Town Park. Karen was responsible for completion of the grant application and the volume of paperwork that followed and Wayne devoted himself to the actual construction and continued maintenance of our park. I would like to invite all of you to a ribbon cutting to be held on Friday, March 30th at 10 a.m. in Godwin at the Town Park located at 4924 Markham Street. Godwin was blessed to partner itself with such professionals all focused on a worthwhile project, benefiting all of the citizens of Northern Cumberland County. Refreshments will follow a very brief ceremony, and I look forward to seeing each and every one of you there. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for coming. Congratulations. Great. Mr. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Aronami Mohammed Smith.
In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, the all-wise, true and living God, the one that the Muslims call Allah, the ones that the Jews call Yahweh, and the ones that the Christians call God. I am Minister Eronimi Smith Muhammad, Fayetteville, North Carolina, born, reared, and raised here, a Vietnam vet. Very proud of it. And I intend to go to the Charlotte Motor Speedway March 30th celebration of the veterans back from Vietnam. America being the greatest country on earth, brothers and sisters, Fedville plays a role. It is now time for Fedville to step up to the plate and be counted for the positive things, not just the negative things. We do not intend to forget. That's one of the main reasons I come here today with uh, this evening. State of Affairs in Fayetteville. Let's not forget Shania Davis. This little girl, let's not forget her. We're doing follow-up and we have the state legislatures, Black Caucus, as well as the Attorney General's office, as well as uh, Lieutenant Governor Walter Dalton's office, aware and watching this situation. Our town of Fayetteville, brothers and sisters, we've come a long way. We have our first African-American mayor, God willing, soon we have our first African-American police chief, soon. We also very, very uh, posit positive that the fact that a new city manager will be forthcoming. Do not forget Fayetteville State University did extremely well in the CIW basketball championship. I was there. We turned out the entire auditorium in Charlotte. Everybody expect us to lose against the undefeated St. Aug. We whooped them at 1230 that night. Do not tell us what our students and young people cannot do. In terms of crime, make these young people feel good about themselves. Don't treat them like dirt, and they will excel. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming. So our next speaker is Ms. Wendy Michener. I'm Wendy Mishner, 223 Hillside, and you all have uh, in front of you one of these. And I'm just going to walk you through it. Um, I came last month about a ordinance um, that Fayetteville would spend its money in Fayetteville first for qualified, when you have a contract go out for a qualified business. So what this is, is encouragement. The first, when you open up the first page, you see those circles, and on the left-hand side is the circle of local business and how much of the money stays in our community when you give a contract to a local business. And right next to it is how much money leaves our city when you give the contract to somebody else. And the next page, you have a couple of examples. The first one is pharmacies. The economic impact of buying your drugs from a local pharmacy versus the economic impact of dry, buying your drugs from a chain. It's pretty dramatic, five times. And then we have uh, groceries, where a grocery store, even though they have such slim margins, it's still almost twice the impact if you go to a local grocery store instead of going to a chain. We have restaurants. <coughs> There again, it's about twice the impact if you go to Zorba's or Pietro's as opposed to the Red Lobster. And going to the, to the last one, I just wanted to highlight this is for everybody. They did a, the people who did this, they were looking at a particular town, and that particular town had $8.4 billion in retail sales. And they said, well, what if 10% of that went from, from chains to local. And the effect, $140 million of new income in that, without spending a dime more, you get $140 million more. And 1,600 new jobs. Wouldn't you love to see 1,600 new jobs? Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Mr. Charles Fager.
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'm here to speak to you briefly about the proposal to put tolls on Interstate 95. When I heard about this idea a few weeks ago, I traveled up that road frequently. I sat up most of a whole night to read the big fat report that the Department of Transportation put out about it, followed up that reading with uh, considerable research to see about what the experience of other communities and states was with uh, these kinds of plans. And as a result of that, it seems to me that for many reasons, this plan would turn Interstate 95 into the road to disaster for Fayetteville, for Cumberland County, and for the other seven counties through which it traverses in North Carolina, not to mention the rest of the Eastern Carolina region. That's true for several reasons. Let me try to just tick some of them off quickly. First of all, maybe most important, it would be a kick in the head to efforts by Fayetteville, Cumberland County, and the other counties to bring new companies and new jobs because it would impose heavy duty expenses on their efforts, not to mention a similar burden on existing, particularly small businesses. And it also would add an inflation tax for everybody in the region, even if you never travel the highway, because most everything we buy comes by trucks, and so the cost would be passed on to us. And this kind of a burden would fall particularly on those of low income and, as a matter of fact, people of color in this region. The eight counties through which Interstate 95 traverses in North Carolina are 49 percent people of color. The state as a whole is at 32 percent. Poverty in this area, in this region, is at 20 percent, whereas the state is 15 percent. So this, these impacts I've talked to you about are going to fall most heavily on the people least able to afford them. So this plan is a bad idea. I have a sort of a fact sheet about it, which I will leave with the clerk. I have sort of a button here. I would like you to consider joining the uh, county commissioners of Johnston County, as well as uh, Congresswoman Renee Elmers, in speaking up as a body, telling them to go back to the to the drawing boards and get us a plan we can live with, which will not turn Interstate 95 into the road to disaster. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you for coming. Sir, our next speaker is Pastor Mark Rowden. Mr. Mayor, to the City Council, to the citizens of Fayetteville, I'm Pastor Mark Rowden of the Savannah Baptist Church. I want to speak very briefly uh, about the DWB issue. And I want to say that growing up in Houston, Texas, I spent some 23 years in the military and I never thought that I could make a place like Fayetteville home. But I want to say that after 17 years of being a resident of Fayetteville, I am a proud citizen of Fayetteville. And Fayetteville have made some great progress over the last several months. However, it has not come without growing pains. And I want to commend the city council uh, for taking bold steps to listen and do those things for concerned citizens. I also still believe in my heart, and I commend uh, Chief Bergermine for being a stellar law enforcement officer. And I still believe that the Fayetteville police is still Fayetteville's finest. One of the things that I've learned is that if a city is going to grow, it must deal with some of the tough and sensitive issues. And you all have done that. And my prayer tonight is that this city will come together and grow beyond what we have been faced with that we will move forward. And I know that we can. We don't want our differences to separate us. When I heard that Fayetteville again won uh, the All-American City, I was proud again to be a citizen of Fayetteville. And what we have experienced does not take away from that. I often hear <clears throat> people say that uh, All-American City is a city without problems. I don't believe that. I believe an all-American city is a, city is a city that has problems and deal with them face on. Again, our prayer is that our city and the citizens can grow and move forward from this. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Mayor, our next speaker is Pastor Brewington. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council, and 
all those that are here tonight. I'm just happy and pleased to be here tonight. But uh, I live at 128 uh, Breckenridge Drive in Rayford, North Carolina. I passed the Beauty Spot Missionary Baptist Church located at 7572 Old Rayford Road. Uh, we are the church that uh, spawned the, uh, your predecessor, Marshall B. Pitts, uh, as mayor of Fedville. Uh, I decided today about 4.30 that I would come and just share uh, because I'm concerned about some of the rhetoric that has been exchanged, some of the idea that the ministers are uh, hate mongers or because we oppose the issue of driving while black, uh, that we hate the city and we hate the police. I come to share with you as being a, a person that was born here in Fedville that I never hate the police. I've always respected them. Uh, matter of fact, I have nothing but uh, love and uh, respect and a deep appreciation for law enforcement and the city uh, leaders. And I want to share just a story that, that uh, I believe uh, you can appreciate. I lived at 123 Wright Street in, in Fayetteville down on the Wilmington Road. Uh, during that time period in the first grade, I wouldn't go to school. Uh, I flunked the first grade because I wouldn't go to school. They had truant officers then, but because the truant officers were not effective, couldn't get me to go to school, they sent the city police after me. And my older sister told the police where I was hiding. I was under the bed. He grabbed me by my feet, pulled me from under the bed, took me outside, and explained to me that he couldn't put me in the front seat, so he had to put me in the back seat. He took me up the road, I see my time running out, stopped at Mr. Fred Johnson's store, bought me a honey bun and uh, a Pepsi Cola, took me to school. I didn't stay that day, but I promised him I would go to school. The next day I went up, I went to school. Well, because what I do is not because I hate you, it's because I love you, because I respect you, because I appreciate you, because I made a promise to a police officer a long time ago that I would go to school. The end result was I graduated from East Smith in 1968. I served 21 years in the military. I served as a police officer on the sheriff's department. I served as military police in the in the Army, retired in 1989, finished uh, the military, obtained a master's degree in theology and a doctorate in pastoral counseling. I love the police. I love this city. I'm a product of this city. And anything I do is because I want the city to be better. I want us to, to be able to have our children obtain and receive the appreciation that some police officer, some white police officer, 56 years ago showed to me. So our final speaker is Pastor Jeffrey White. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. My name is Jeffrey White. My address is 1933 Winlock Drive, Fayetteville, North Carolina. I live in District 6. Mr. William Crisp is my council member. I currently serve in the role of pastor of a local church. My wife and I have lived in this community for 11 years. I raised three sons and a daughter here. We raised them to honor God, love their family, and love their neighbors. I have two sons who are in currently serving in the United States Navy. It deeply troubles me to my heart to see both my sons to what I believe has been racially profiling. I do not have the time in this form to share the disappointing details of each of their experiences or of, of these local officers. Neither was charged with an offense or was ticketed for that incident. They both have clean records. They serve in this country's military and both have served in harm's way. One of them was handcuffed during a stop. It broke my heart to hear him, his major concern, and I quote, I hope none of my dad's members see me handcuffed behind this car and think that I've done something wrong. I want you to know that I love this city. I love this, this community. And what you want, Mr. Mayor, what the city council wants, we want the same. I'm asking you to search your heart and consider if maybe when you see me and other men that look just like me, you don't see me just as a black man. Do you see a partner in progress or do you see criminals just because of the color of our skin? 
Please help us to move forward tonight as a whole all-American city. Our, un our united team committed to justice, fairness, and equality for all. A community committed to safety and security for every citizen, white, black, brown, yellow, red, and one community. As Reverend Troy Williams said, we have to make choices. I quote DJ Hare, build more walls, build more bridges. I would ask this community to consider something Brother Wes Cookman always says, our community is not truly great for any of us until it's great for all of us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Fayetteville City Council for your courage and our prayers with you will always be toward heaven. Thank you. So we have no further speakers. Okay, that'll close the public forum. We appreciate everyone for uh, coming tonight and, and being with us and sharing your thoughts on our city. We'll now move to item six, which is tonight's uh, consent agenda. Mr. Hurst. Move to approve. Have a motion to approve. Second Thank by you. Mr. Bates. Thank you, Mr. Bates. Any discussion on the motion? <coughs> Mess your vote, please. Mr. Massey. Approve. Ms. Davey. Approve. Approve. Thank you, ma'am. That's unanimous. Thank you, counsel. We'll move now to item 7.1, consideration of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives Noble's findings regarding allegations of bias-based policing by the Fedville Police Department. We have, Mr. Trump, you want to introduce them, or we're going to have Chief Wilson here? Or how would you like to do it, sir? Yes, good evening, counsel. In response to the city council's uh, moratorium scheduled on, uh, or adopted, rather, on January 23rd, uh, we immediately set, set forth and uh, hired the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives to come in and conduct the study that was a part of the moratorium. The study specifically was to deter determine whether members of the department engaged in racial profiling activities. Uh, leading that study, uh, two members are here tonight with us. The uh, lead consultant is uh, Chief uh, Jimmy L. Wilson, Chief Retired. Uh, Chief Wilson is a 39-year law enforcement veteran, retired uh, Deputy Chief of Police for the City of Washington, D.C., and also retired Chief of Police for the City of Suffolk, Virginia. Joining Chief Wilson tonight is Senior Consultant uh, Drew Canada, uh, who is a retired police commander for the uh, Greens, uh, Greensboro Police Department. So, gentlemen, uh, I think you've uh, worked long and hard on this study. Uh, please come forward and present the findings. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. I'd like to thank the mayor, the city council, city manager, and all of you for allowing us to come here tonight to talk about the noble study. The noble study consisted of a project team of five individuals. There's a project man manager, was a full-time employee of Noble, Pamela Chapman, the research and qualitative analyst, Dr. Ernest Quimby, Director of Graduate Studies from Howard University. And of course, you've uh, heard my introduction as well as my colleague, Drew. And we had a third consultant, Dave Scott, who's the Deputy Chief with the transit police in Philadelphia. We came to Fayetteville on the 24th of January. We spent three and a half days on site conducting interviews and doing policy reviews. And we continued that process when we went home by conducting additional telephonic interviews as well as 
do policy reviews, and we make constant contact with the police department. Throughout this report, we'll be talking about CALEA. That's the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement. It's interesting that CALEA was actually created in 1979 by the four professional law enforcement organizations in the United States. Those organizations are NOBLE, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, IECP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, PERF, the Police Executive Research Forum, and NSA, the National Sheriff's Association. During this process, we started off by looking at the PERF operational study of the Fayetteville Police Department. They recommended modifications to make some changes. They didn't indicate that things were wrong, just modifications. And then they thought that these modifications would better align the police department with national best practices. They made 53 recommendations. To his credit, the Fayetteville Police Department addressed all 53 recommendations. Then we looked at the CALEA accreditation process. All standards were met during that process except one, and that was corrected on site. The Fayetteville Police Department achieved accreditation seven times since 1989, which is the date of the first time that it was accredited. NOBA became involved in this project when complaints were made by members of the community. The allegations involved 38,950 traffic stops that were made in 2010. This is information that came from the community. The community also said that of these 38,000 stops, there were 89 consensual searches and that there were three times as many African Americans stopped and there was no review of the traffic stop data by the police department. And the timely statistics were not submitted by the department to the state. They also talked about searches that were conducted, consent searches not conducted without consent. Uh, without consent. They also indicated that Caucasian citizens were ticketed for objective stops. And what is meant by objective stops is those violations that involved items like red light, stop signs, those kinds of issues. They also indicated that African Americans were stopped for subjective stops. And that means things like mechanical violations, seat belts, those kinds of things. And then they said that the driver is not told of the articulable reason for the stop, even though there was a requirement. And they felt that police officers may have met that requirement, but they should, they should have told the driver and did not. The community further indicated that there were some necessary steps for resolution of this issue. And they said that they were prepared to reach a resolution with the city. And they wanted to see that the city addressed all of the issues thoroughly. They wanted an investigation of police misconduct, and they wanted action taken. They felt that the department should gain the confidence of African American communities and change the culture of the police department and engage in true community policing. That the community should be given awareness training, and apparently there's some training that was offered by the ACLU, and the city should accept that training. They also felt that there's an underrepresentation of African Americans 
in the Fayetteville Police Department. We looked at professional traffic stops. Now, professional traffic stop means the mechanics of a traffic stop. How a traffic stop is, conduct, is conducted from the beginning, how a police officer approaches the driver, what is said to the driver. When we looked at the police department's policy and compared it with national standards, we felt that not only did the, did the department comply with national standards, in some cases they exceeded the national standards. In our research, we looked at the Arnold versus Arizona decision, which required police officers to identify themselves, address the driver by the appropriate title, Mr., Miss, tell them why they were stopped. And if the driver had any further questions, then the police officer was obligated to give his badge number, his or her badge number, and supervisor's name. We also looked at the New Jersey State Police Consent Decree. <clears throat> and that's one of those decrees that really expanded on traffic stops. It had a long litany of information. And then the National Highway and Transportation Safety Administration issued an article called Tips on How to Conduct Professional traffic stops, gave a long list on what to do and how to do it, and the department was in compliance. Drew. I'd like to speak uh, about the state law that requires reporting of traffic stops and where some of the problems actually lie and the recommendations that, uh, that we're going to make about that. First of all, there's no secret that the traffic stop report is required by state law. Uh, the, uh, there's a separate portion of that that deals with consent searches, and that has been the source of uh, the beginning of this as, as we understand it was the data being uh, either inaccurate or skewed or so out of whack that it uh, raised concern. Which is a button? This one? The other one? This one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Part of the problem, as you've heard over and over, I'm sure, in this room, was that the uh, traffic stop report document does not have a place for location of the traffic stop. And so when confronted with that uh, question, the police department was forced to try to explain uh, why African Americans were stopped more, uh, searched more, and where that uh, was likely to be occurring. And quite honestly, they were not able to do that to your satisfaction. And uh, we, we understand that. Uh, Relying purely on the traffic stop report is not the way to go. What they have done, uh, effective January 1, 2012, is to uh, significantly modify that policy. Uh, we, when we were here in uh, late January, we reviewed the policy modification, found it to be satisfactory. However, with the moratorium that had just been put in place, the data field was so small we really could not conduct much of an analysis as to whether it was actually being done correctly or not. It appeared that it was. The, the, the few numbers that they had uh, during that first few days of January until the moratorium was put in place all checked out. But you need a much larger uh, sample of data and an examination of, uh, of all of those traffic stops over a longer period of time to ensure yourselves that uh, the rules are actually being followed as changed in that policy. Uh, without getting into the uh, weeds of the policy, they do require a separate entry in their records management system that, uh, that dictates, or that explains where the location was, what the reason for the stop was, and if a search was given, was, was asked for, a consent search, why that was done, some articulable reason. 
they've made some other changes that have been uh, positive in our view. They, uh, their records management system uh, is, is a very complex and effective records management system. OSSI is the vendor. Uh, there are many departments across the country that use them. Uh, it's a good product. One of the fields in that product that was customized for North Carolina police departments was an electronic submission of that traffic stop report, meaning that the officer would, in his car or at another computer terminal somewhere, would put, out, put the details of the traffic stop <coughs> under the TSR in the records management system, and it would be submitted electronically. They realized that uh, as a result of some of the complaints that came up that that was not a good thing. And so they backed out of that and went back to handwritten TSRs. Uh, we think that's the right thing to do, and this is the reason. That allows supervisory review of those TSRs before they get committed to the, to the system. Uh, and that, that has been done. Again, we're, we're only a few days into that, and the data needs to be expanded over time before we can make a serious analysis of that. A separate issue, and uh, this is probably more significant than it will sound. The uh, state law requires the TSR to be completed on pure traffic stops. Officer observes a violation, makes a traffic stop, uh, does the TSR, moves on. What the uh, Fayetteville Police Department was doing, uh, and I guess this is historical, information. They had been doing them on other stops as well. For example, uh, there's a broadcast uh, for being on the lookout for a certain car. Well, the officer spots the car and stops it. Well, the state law does not require a TSR on that kind of stop because it's not a pure traffic stop for a traffic violation. It's a stop based on another, another reason. And they had been doing those, therefore their numbers were higher. Uh, there's, there's other examples of that. Uh, uh, they could make an investigative stop, for example. Uh, you've got your uh, uh, a tip, pure tip, that someone was uh, engaged in criminal activity, and they, uh, the patrol <coughs> officer spots that car <coughs> and makes that stop. Again, not a pure traffic stop based on a traffic-related reason and does not qualify for TSR. However, Fayetteville PD was, was doing that. Now, when we discovered that, we asked them, why are you doing this? They said, well, we've been, this is what we've been doing. And uh, don't you think you ought to change that? And they said, very candidly, yes, we do. However, we don't want to be accused of trying to manipulate the data in the midst of a, of a crisis. So I guess to their credit, they did not, on their own, stop doing that, and as, as far as I know, uh, as of today, they're still doing it that way. Uh, however, we strongly recommend that they go to the standard TSR requirements, which makes them comparable to other cities in North Carolina that are doing it that way. And, it, and it, it's going to have the result of, of lessening some of the traffic stop uh, incidents that are reported on the TSRs. They did something else. There's uh, there's a retention schedule in state law that requires them to keep those paper TSRs, if they use them, for two years. I mean, I'm sorry, for one year. And they, uh, they changed their policy as a result of some of this uh, controversy to extend, extend that for two years, and they make those actual paper TSRs available for public viewing during normal business hours. So a citizen can come in and look at a TSR if they choose to. The uh, CALEA requirements uh, touch in numerous ways on this whole issue. Uh, one of the uh, CALEA requirements is reviewing traffic stop data uh, annually. The, they have to uh, prepare a report that talks about uh, the, the nature of traffic stops, and it's really not just a report, it's more of an analysis. And it's done for a number of reasons, one being training, needs. Uh, of course, the, the idea would be that, that the senior command would have a, a 
snapshot view once a year of what we've been doing in traffic stops over the past year. Well, they recognized uh, that that was not sufficient in Fayetteville, again, partly based on this, uh, this issue, and they have now gone to quarterly review uh, for that. Again, these, uh, these issues need to mature because not all these changes were made at one time, but gradually over the past several months they've been made, but it's still a little, little early to determine whether they're totally effective because the data field is just not that large. Uh, In-car cameras. I think there's some question as whether the 213 number is, is accurate. It may be 217 or, or more. And I think there's still some debate as to uh, something about the, the cars that are, uh, that are spare cars and whether the money should be spent to uh, equip them. Uh, we have reviewed their uh, schedule for getting everything done. It seems to be in compliance with what you all asked for. Uh, as I understand it, by April 1st, uh, the, that should be complete, uh, with the exception of the spare cars. The, the risk of not doing the spare cars obviously is that if my car breaks down and I go and pick up a spare car that doesn't have a camera and I have the critical incident, then there's no review of that because we just cho chosen not to put the, the camera in the car. Now, I can tell you, they want to put the cameras in those spare cars, and I would urge you to, uh, we would urge you to, to uh, think positively about that. That way it's all same all the time with the cameras. <coughs> and this camera system that they have invested in uh, is state-of-the-art stuff and should, should do the job that, uh, that you all want done. The early warning system is another CALEA requirement. Uh, quite honestly, it does not specifically touch on this issue, but we have, uh, in conversations with the department, have recommended that they, uh, they add that on their own rather than uh, the pure CALEA requirement doesn't, does not include that, the traffic stop data. It mostly deals with uh, complaints, it deals with uh, uh, use of force, it deals with uh, negative things that would occur to a particular officer. And the compilation of that would, would raise a flag about a particular officer and as, as an early warning and allow the supervision management to take care of that. We're, we're urging them to uh, include the traffic stop uh, information in the early warning system. Numbers, locations, that sort of thing, just purely as a review. Uh, and I, uh, <coughs> My conversation, my impression is that they are willing to do that uh, if, uh, if you all direct that. Um, we had a little trouble with the term hot spots, quite honestly. Uh, we don't, I know that it's used, it's used nationwide, it's used uh, uh, frequently to determine, to, to uh, describe an area that uh, is a problem area. Uh, we found that it had negative uh, connotations, particularly in view of what uh, you and the city and the police department have been through. And we would ask, uh, would, would suggest that a new term be determined and we abandon the, the term hotspot. Uh, however, if it, it doesn't really matter what you call it, it's still there. So I think the uh, strategies. Uh, of determining where those areas are ought to be clearly described and available for your review. Again, uh, it's my impression that the department is willing to do that if you direct it. The uh, reliability of the statistical data has been uh, one mishap after the other. And this goes back to uh, 2010. As you all know, this is not news. Uh, there's been uh, problems with uh, clerical staff. There's been problems with uh, some entry that didn't get done right. There's been some late submission for whatever reason. There's been this and that. I don't think anything individually was designed to be that way. It just turned out to be that way uh, and continues to be. And there's, uh, uh, there's still some, some holes in that and some, some flaws. Uh, 
that's got to be fixed. If you're going to follow the state law and going to, going to make sure that uh, that data is one of the yardsticks that's used to measure the community <coughs> effectiveness of the police department, then you need, <coughs> to, need, to, make, need to fix that. Uh, I'm not sure it's on this slide, but we are recommending a, a full-time uh, clerical type person to, uh, to be specifically in charge of that uh, under the direction of uh, a supervisor that stays uh, abreast of that essentially 24-7. During the qualitative analysis done by Dr. Quimby, there were several findings and several other comments of, uh, of note, and we'll share those with you. One was, he said that there are persistent problems um, that exist in this whole matter, and almost all of the problems centered around communications, communication between the police department and the community and with the city. And as a result, trust issues developed. He also indicated that racial profiling may or may not exist in the city of Fayetteville. He, says, he suggested that when you look at the <coughs> anecdotal narratives and you look at it very subjectively, then you can infer that there's racial profiling. And he also indicated that when you looked at the patterns of police encounters, such as traffic stops, and um, the number of African Americans who were stopped compared to others in the community, then that could be an inference of racial profiling. He also indicated that when you look at the numbers, look at the statistical data, and you look at it objectively, there could be a hint of racial profiling, but at the same time, the statistical data, that same statistical data, suggests that you cannot prove racial profiling. So there's a series of things that are involved here. And even though I've said a number of things that may be confusing, confusing he's saying pretty much that there are many ways that racial profiling can be implied, but when it deals with statistical analysis, and in particular, the data that we have and that was presented uh, to us and that we have tonight, it's difficult to say that racial profiling exists, and he's not prepared to say that. He said that one of the biggest issues uh, right now in getting this whole matter resolved is that there are hardened views. You know, people on both sides are posturing and it's blocked communication. That doesn't seem to be that good exchange of information to facilitate a resolution. He said there are contradic contradictory perceptions and that could be minimized by conflict resolution sessions. He also indicated that the city and the community missed some opportunities for resolution by dealing with this issue early on. He suggested outreach and engagement programs and community education. He says that many people in the community, no matter what the educational level, may not be aware of law enforcement practices or even the laws. The city and the police department should take it upon themselves to educate the community to tell them about consent searches, tell them what that means. Talk about traffic stops, what that means. Talk about many issues involving police response and the delivery of police services and tell them what those things mean. Some of the people in the community view traffic stops as necessary We've been told that police officers are welcome to come in to make traffic stops in their neighborhoods, to conduct searches in their neighborhood, because they are only interested in preventing individuals from coming in, breaking into their homes. But then there are other folk in the very same neighborhood 
who have said that they don't trust the police and they feel that these actions are wrong and even discriminatory. There has been communication. There have been community forums. There have been private meetings. There have been public meetings. There has been issues here at the city council. But at the same time, the communication lacks mutually satisfactory results. It has gone on and on and on, but the satisfaction level has not been there. Now, the police department has made some efforts to facilitate communications, effective communication. And we applaud them for the community wellness program. And we understand that they've done training for personnel in the police department, as well as offer training for the citizens of Fayetteville. The ride along program has been an educational process in itself for citizens. When we look at this whole issue of racial profiling, back in 2001, Noble conducted a study and issued a report. This was early on in this discussion about racial profiling and resulted from the case involving the New Jersey State Police in 1999. Early thinking, and when I say early thinking, that includes Noble's thinking, indicated that bias-based policing was established by comparing the aggregate of the number of African Americans who were stopped for traffic violations, and then making that comparison with the aggregate number of African Americans in the total population. There's been some fresh thinking along those lines, and we now feel that the aggregate approach is misleading. Social scientists suggest that other things should be considered, like socioeconomic factors, operational measures, you know, whether traffic stops occurred, why they occurred, whether or not police were deployed and maybe squads or, or whatever to address an issue where fatalities may have occurred in order to reduce the number of fatalities, in order to respond to areas where complaints were received about drug violations, in order to curb those drug violations. So there are a number of things that should be included in that discussion that have not and were not included. Again, it's no longer sufficient to compare those aggregates that I mentioned before. There are additional information that need to be included. There's a special note, and this decisions on racial profiling are paramount, and they should not be based on analysis of incomplete data and solely on anecdotal evidence. What we have is a vast number, a vast amount of st statistical data, but it's incomplete. We also have anecdotal evidence from the community, from other folk, but we can't use either one, one or the other, in order to make a determination on racial profiling. We looked at some other issues that might very well impact this entire issue. Now, back in 2010, there were 22,000 traffic citations were written by the police department. Almost 7,000 of those traffic citations were written by 20 Fayetteville police officers. And that means that 5% of all officers were responsible for writing more than 32% of all traffic citations in 2010. When you look at 2011, the totals are different, but the results are the same. 5% responsible for writing 32% of traffic citations. That may be significant, and it may not. 
We don't know. When you look at deployment, we talked about that once again. We don't know whether these police officers were employed to curb the fatalities, reduce the fatalities, or to address traffic issues, I'm sorry, uh, drug issues. We don't know that. The information is not available. We also need to know whether police officers were accused of misconduct, harassment, unprofessional conduct, all of those things. But it can, we, we cannot make that determination. And the reason why we cannot is because of the North Carolina law that prohibits revealing the identity of those police officers in conjunction with the number of traffic tickets that they wrote. We need to know the units that they were assigned, the shifts, the beats, other operational activities. Now, we believe that this information may actually present a skewing effect of the total numbers. And I talked about 2010, 2011, but 2009 and earlier are not available to us. Now, when I talked about these 20 officers, there is nothing to suggest that any of these 20 officers were involved in misconduct. We don't know that, and we're not suggesting that. <clears throat> that unknown information is just another piece of missing data that we would need to make a determination. And in conclusion, using all available data collected in the study, it would be difficult to describe the police department's traffic enforcement, enforcement as racial profiling. And then, and I'm going to read this, the raw data supports some of the negative concerns expressed by the community. We acknowledge that. The police department has acknowledged that. African Americans were subjected to traffic stops and consensual searches at a disproportionately higher rate than others in the community. The statistical data bears that out. This practice remains a concern and requires the immediate attention of the police department and the community to achieve an expeditious resolution. Now, we have um, 24 recommendations that we'd like to share to you for the police department moving forward. I'd like to go back, like to go back just a second to the uh, to the previous slide or two when we're talking about the 20 officers. Uh, if you'll recall, we were recommending that the early warning system be expanded to include traffic-related issues when, in fact, it has not been in the past. Now, is that going to solve the problem? I don't know, but at least it would give the police administration the, uh, the data that they need uh, on not only the 20 officers, but on every officer in the department uh, that's in that high production level of uh, traffic citations. So that, that uh, early warning system comment that we made uh, 10 minutes ago or so plays right into that last uh, issue. We, uh, we can fast forward a little bit through the uh, recommendations. We, uh, uh, because we've discussed several of them already, I'm not going to miss any of the important ones. Again, continue to address the recommendations made by the Perth study. Uh, keep current on best practice in law enforcement. Uh, increase the use of public accountability methods, and I'm going to speak to that in a minute. Uh, the consent form is warranted. We, we did not know when we uh, wrote this section of the report that the consent form uh, was being developed and deployed here. Uh, in the Fayetteville Police Department. We were uh, strongly in favor of the written consent waiver for consent, written waiver for consent searches and traffic stops. They have done that. In fact, what they did, they took two documents that they had uh, and combined them into one, and the result is, is a multi-purpose consent form that's good for investigations as well as for traffic stops. And it uh, appears to be very effectively designed. Again, we talked about discontinuing use of TSRs. Uh, 
number six, same thing. We've talked about that on the uh, streamline the TSR reporting to what the law requires. Uh, they have, in fact, uh, effected the first of the Jan January 1st uh, in number seven, required the officer to document reasons for traffic stop outside of the TSR. Um, and, and the, this number eight is a, is a field contact issue, which is related to that. That's just where they do it. They have uh, cards in number nine here. They have cards that are issued to uh, all the patrol cars, and they're laminated, and they, they, they have tips for a successful traffic stop on them. They revised that card uh, and put some uh, additional legal information on it and replaced those uh, with the new cards. <coughs> Again, we talked about the two years and making the uh, TSRs available. Uh, they have a, a brochure, have had a brochure for years on how to uh, file a complaint on a police officer. Uh, upon review, it needed some tweaking, and they have redone that, and the new brochures are published and available now, and they're much more, much more uh, contemporary. And uh, there's a link on the website to, to get to the way to file the complaint if someone's interested in doing it that way. Uh, now, number 12 uh, is, is uh, it looks like a short line there, but we want to talk about a review team. This is something that we, uh, we recommend. Currently, there, uh, there is no legislated process for citizens to be involved in the review of complaints against police officers. This is an issue that uh, is commonly called Citizen Review Board or a number of other titles. Um, and as you can imagine, most police uh, officials and officers are resistant to that. There have been some very bad experiences across the country with that idea. There have also been some good ones. Uh, our uh, recommendation is a hybrid, and in our recommendation, which is detailed in your, in your written report, uh, we recommend that, that the chief of police, with uh, advice and consent of the city manager, uh, select some community people to be involved as, as a citizen review team. Well, a complaint review team. It's not really a citizen review team. The team is larger than just citizens. It includes a couple of uh, police commanders, perhaps. It also includes possibly a, a lower-ranking officer. Uh, and the way it, uh, it would work is that the process does not really change up through the complaint being investigated by the police department and a determination being made by police command as to whether the complaint is sustained or not sustained or unfounded, uh, whatever the categories are, and they're detailed in your uh, notes there. So that doesn't change. But at that point, the chief, according to our recommendation, would have a decision to make. He looks at the, at the complaint, looks at the substance of it, looks at the gravity of it, looks at the impact that this sort of issue might have on the community. And he assembles his review team. And he has his advocate, which we would say would be the uh, internal affairs commander, to, uh, to go to the team and make the presentation to the team of what the department heard, what they did, what they determined at which point the review team would, again, representative of the community and police command, would review that and determine uh, if they agree, quite simply. They might say, well, I think there's some unanswered questions here, and we'd like to know about this or this. Or we completely agree with the decision of the department, or we don't agree, and here's why. That information then goes back to the chief. He has another decision to make. He's not bound by what they say. What he needs to do is read what they say and evaluate it and then make another decision. Does he want to stick with the original position of the department or does he want to modify it based on what the review team's thoughts were? And at that point, if the review team has said no, then he ultimately goes back to them through the advocate and tells them that what the final decision was and the issue is, is settled. 
uh, if, if they have agreed, of course, there's no conflict and things move forward. We haven't gotten the discipline yet because that's the chief's decision at the end of the day. Uh, if, if the uh, complaint is sustained, then he would apply the yardstick of discipline like any other incident, whether or not it went to the review team. We feel that, uh, that that's a hybrid model that might help heal some of the complaints that lack of transparency, uh, some of the complaints of uh, we don't know what's going on, uh, you cover up for your officers, this and that, that we heard it through some of the anecdotal evidence. So we, we just felt like that that was a, a good hybrid model uh, to, to, uh, that has been used in other places and seems to work pretty well. The, the team itself does not investigate. They don't have subpoena power. They don't have anything other than what the chief gives them. So it becomes, uh, I guess you could say, a supervisory issue between the city manager and the chief as to how that team is given their uh, issues to look at. But it would certainly give the community a voice. Number 13, in-car cameras, we've talked about. Uh, the third member of our team that uh, Chief Wilson referred to, uh, Dave Scott, is a, a personnel guy. And he has some concerns about uh, involving human resources. Uh, this is where that came from in the hiring and promotion processes and validation of test instruments and that sort of thing. And they're all well taken. That is also in your book in detail. Slightly off point to this issue, but that, that, that came along in, in when, we were doing, when we were doing what we did. Uh, 15 we've talked about. Oh, 16 is the current practice is that the human relations director has appointed a, quote, community liaison, end quote, to uh, receive bias-based complaints on police officers that happen to come to the Human Relations Commission, not through the police department, but straight to them. Uh, when that is triggered, if, if that complaint occurs, then the Human Relations uh, Community Liaison works in conjunction with the department to shepherd that complaint through the system. And they would be fully aware at the Human Relations uh, Office of what was going on with that bias-based complaint. Uh, unfortunately, if a complaint, currently if a complaint comes straight to the police department, the human relations uh, community liaison is never activated. And we're saying, scrap that plan, let the two of them work on every bias-based complaint together so all sides know what's being said. Human relations is a key, key place here, is, is a key player here and again, we're back to communications. I don't think there's anything intentional on the part of the department. It just hadn't come up that way. But while the policy exists, the circumstances have not so far resulted in it being, being triggered. We say involve the two of them in everything. Again, there's a lot of detail on that in your report. Uh, we talked about having a full-time uh, data entry person. Uh, the term hotspots, we, we recommend you be discontinued. Uh, uh, number 19 is, again, is streamlining back to the uh, only the information required on the uh, TSR for reporting purposes. And 20 is related to that. Uh, we, we suggest that they uh, just do a survey of uh, other departments and see how they're handling that particular issue before they uh, go too far with it. And, and that also might give them some, uh, some ammunition to show that, that maybe uh, it wasn't as bad as it sounded in, in that particular area. Uh, camera policy is done. We saw it today. Uh, early warning system we've talked about. Number 23 is a, uh, is a big one. We're recommending that uh, and again, there's a lot of detail in your, in your notes there. We're recommending that the, a video be produced, probably a 30-minute video, that will uh, be narrated by a member of the community. Uh, 
quite honestly, we recommend that it be somebody who's been on the opposite side of this. So, and let me say this, my anecdotal comment is that I'm sure Chief Wilson will agree and Dave Scott, essentially everybody that we interviewed, seriously, everybody said, what can we do to help? We're, I'm willing to help with this. You know, we, I, I may be, I may be the, the furthest out here on the complaining side, and I may be the furthest out here on the support the department side, but they all wanted to help. They all were willing to, to commit to help. So I think they ought to be put to task on that. So let's, let's uh, have this 30-minute video narrated by someone in this direction, starring the chief first, who talks about the necessity for traffic stops, why we have to do them, how we deploy our officers, and then bring in somebody possibly from the Institute of Government or the police attorney or someone can do this that presents the legal side of responsibilities of the officer and the citizen in a traffic stop and responsibilities specifically of the officer and the citizen in consent in asking for consent search. Next, we would suggest possibly a couple of brief skits involving uh, probably a senior well-known officer of the department that uh, people will recognize and, and have some faith in uh, and, and go through a couple of examples of the right and wrong ways to do things, so at least the right way to do them, whether you include wrong or not. And then wrap it up with the chief kind of tying it all together and the narrator working his way out of it. That way we've got the, the, the meat of the presentation is the legal side. We're getting the message out to here's the facts about the legal side, supplemented on either side by the necessity for traffic stops and the skits that demonstrate. That's uh, essentially, excuse me, that's essentially uh, number 23. <clears throat> we think that these recommendations that we're making should be made public. I'm gonna think we ran out of slides here. Let me, let me make sure that, uh, that one, one posted on the website. Say again. Post recommendations on the website. Post recommendations on the website. That was what that one was. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to cover this right now? Mm -hmm. I don't want to say in summary, but uh, there's a conclusions page in your, in your document. And uh, I'd like to quote couple of things from that conclusions page is 45 by the way in your in your packet um, the, the data problem is in fact part of the problem but that's not the whole problem and we're saying that uh, straighten out the data end of it which is going to make future analyses easier to do using the right information. Mm -hmm. However, this is what I want to quote. Cleaning up the data for future analyses needs to be done, but the significant key to long-term resolution will be detailed attention by the Fayetteville Police Department management and supervisors to ensure policy compliance in all aspects of this complex issue. The department needs to constantly examine its mission and its effectiveness at reaching enforcement goals balanced against the needs and concerns of the community. Uh, and if you think about it, that actually says a lot because we, we, we know the data is, uh, is inaccurate or at least incomplete. We know we've got to fix that. But all these new policies that they've written would all point to solving this issue. I don't. And it, and it, uh, and it points. I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. No, I'm sorry. And it points to the, uh, the, the willingness of the department to change policy and to implement the consent form and to do this and do that, uh, do the video, establish the, uh, the uh, review team involve human relations. All those things are great. But the bottom line is that supervision 
of those rank and file officers. And command review of the supervisors <laughs> doing the supervising are going to, going to make this thing work. Uh, all of us with uh, either police or military experience understand the chain of command and the, the accountability that goes up and down that chain. And it's imperative in our minds that the supervisors and commanders uh, do their job. And the final comment, Mr. Mayor, and then we will take questions if you desire. Yes, sir, please. Is that the police department acknowledges that there are things that they could have done better. And they've demonstrated a commitment to fix any problems. But the issue remains that the raw data still indicates that racial disparity and traffic enforcement and that there is a disproportionate number of African Americans subjected to traffic stops and consent searches. This is a remaining concern that the Fayetteville Police Department and the community must resolve together and it should be done quickly. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for your report, and I'm sure we'll have some questions uh, from council members here. I'll start. I have a couple, sir, if you have a second. Yes, sir. I'd like to understand a little more about these 20 police officers, and I think to the average citizen, it's, we don't, it's difficult to understand exactly how we might not know who they are. And, and as you said, it could very well be that were we to know who they were, it might explain exactly why those are so high. So we don't know. We don't know. When you say we're not allowed legally to know who the officers were does does that extend to the police the, does the police department know who they are yeah. they know yeah so they're able to monitor that situation and they would know those 20 officers are five percent that writing that large number of t that's something that they would be able to manage yeah, sir. Well, that, that's where we got the information okay. from the police department but they know the individual sir they do okay well actually and let me just clarify this um, the police department did a search on the NCDOJ website Okay, now they were able to determine the 20 police officers uh, by number alone. It's my understanding that they didn't have a name associated with those numbers, just strictly numbers. So the, the, what, let me explain uh, exactly uh, how that yeah, You works. might want to explain that. Yeah. I, I don't think we're really, okay. you know, well, the, really the, way, the way it really works is that the, the state law is intent on protecting any individual officer's identity. And, and there's, there's sections in that state law that, that speak directly to that. And one of those is that you can't use his name, her name, you can't use his badge number, her badge number, you can't, can't use anything that easily identifies who that officer is. So what uh, agencies have had to do statewide is assign a, uh, essentially a secret code number to each person. And if, if you ask me, is there anybody in the Fayetteville Police Department that knows who those numbers are, which, what number, code numbers assigned, the answer is yes, they do, because somebody in IT or who the chief is designated responsible for that function. But it's not widespread knowledge. And the, the, as far as I know, the command staff doesn't, doesn't really know who they are. But, but when they did the search in response to our request, they pulled, they went to the website and pulled up those top 20 by code number, if that, if that helps. Well, it just, it just begs more questions. Let's just say that you're using that as a management tool. You see numbers that alert you that maybe I need to ask more questions, but you can't know who to ask questions of? Can I, one Go more ahead. time? Well, that, that goes back to our early warning system comment. We're saying that that way of doing it is not necessarily the right way to do it. The supervisors know who, let's say I'm, I'm a sergeant and I've got 10 officers. I know which two or three of my officers are writing a lot of tickets. That, and, and the department knows that. that. That's where we're saying the focus should be on, on what they do know and what they, they have observed about the performance of people. And, and, and if, you, if they want to set a bar of... Uh, of X number of tickets or X number, and I don't know whether the traffic enforcement 
folks are, are different than the regular patrol. I don't know exactly about the deployment, but they, they can uh, deal with that on the early warning side rather than purely from the Department of Justice website. And that early warning system was, you, you were suggesting one of your recommendations, that should be expanded to include traffic-related issues. That's right. Which have not been included in the past. That's correct. So that would be an enhancement to that. That would be a good be. way to catch any issues. It, that it would around. be. Now, they, they probably have a computer program that, uh, that it, with an agency this large mm -hmm. that they've purchased that manages that, and it might take some tweaking. That's a better way of doing it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hare. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Drew and Mr. Wilson. I, I was going to ask a question about the early warning system, but the mayor uh, did ask that question. Now, you did say something about the data entry that we need to have someone within the police department that, that's on a full-time data employee. This information is going to be coming in whenever that officer is on his or her laptop. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. not, not exactly. Okay. Because they they remember it would it was that way, mm -hmm. but they went back to the paper system so they could do supervisor review, and I think that's a very important point. Mm -hmm. It's a good, it's a great question. The way we envision it is the officer in the patrol car makes a traffic stop, pulls out of his briefcase the handwritten TSR mm -hmm. form, fills it out, turns it into his supervisor, it's reviewed, and then it goes to the data clerk. Data clerk loads that into the information base. That's only part of the breakdown, sir. P part of the problem has been that they uh, they have been doing this with part-time people. Uh, mm -hmm. They've been doing it with people who had multiple other assignments. Not that, they, that this has to be a totally full-time assignment, but one person needs to be responsible for that, supervised very carefully by a, a, a middle-level manager that that is, is tuned into the whole issue, not so much the mechanics. Mm -hmm. And that person would make sure that that data is getting entered right. Now, I don't mind saying that it would appear, if you read that statute, that the state is supposed to analyze the data on their behalf and give them feedback. And as far as I know, that has not happened. So in their defense, and, I, and I, my guess would be that probably has not happened anywhere else particularly with budget cutbacks and that sort of thing. So uh, I think that the, I, I say I, we recommend that somebody have that responsibility uh, as, as their job and it's supervised. And that, that person would be sending the data to Raleigh after it's approved internally. And are you to say, at least that's what I'm thinking, that that is probably one of the most important parts of the data portion and it being uh, put in correctly and that because we've been getting a whole lot of stuff yeah, it's just been crazy with this data yeah I don't so I don't think that, that at the, I really don't think any of our evidence indicates that at the officer level there's any manipulation of anything right. I think the officers are doing their thing mm -hmm. I think when it gets out of their hands is where it gets skewed and gets out of control, possibly because there's not enough direct attention to getting that entered correctly. Let me ask this other question, if I could, please. Uh, on the, uh, I don't know if it's the, the, the TSR or, and, and correct me, um, the, the form where they did some modifications to include the location Yes, sir. Of the stop, and um, and you said that I guess you were meaning that the spacing area for that data to be recorded was not was was not enough of room. No, sir. Okay, no, what did no, you mean? No, no, it was. It, let's let's describe current practice. I think is the easiest thing. Mm -hmm. They have they have expanded. They have expanded their. Uh, uh, rules about what has to be reported outside of the TSR. They've got the TSR, which does not include location. That's been said over and over and over again for, for months. Their uh, records management system, the internal records management system, uh, now requires uh, entries made about the location and reasons for the stop and reasons for the search in, in its simplest f fashion. 
Okay. <clears throat> also, l let me add that on the TSR, there is a data field for location, but the state law only allows the city of Fayetteville to be entered, not a street address. That's what that's true. Mm. Okay. Mm. And that just, that just tracks uh, who it gets assigned to in the big database. Now, and another new part of the modification, I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, that is taking place, well, soon, if not now, that anyone, if they have been, st well, anyone that has a question about a particular stop, I guess they would need to have that ticket number or something that they could go over to uh, our police station and there would be a record there of that, um, that stop and the uh, TRS information. So they, they, what would they need if they went over there? Well, that information will be entered into their records and, and, management and, and, system. And, and when does that begin, or has it begun? Okay, as soon as the ticket is issued, the tickets are issued, and the field contact is prepared. Then it's turned into the supervisor, and that entry process takes place at that point. Now, it goes into the um, records management system and there are many ways that it can be queried. And um, if their system is like most systems in law enforcement, and I believe it is. I'll say, say that again, please. If their system is like most RMS systems in law enforcement, and I believe it is, and I think they have OSSI, you can uh, query the system by putting in a number of things. You can put in the street location, and that will come up. Uh, Name. Yeah, Violet put in put name. in put in the name that can come up. So, but no, but and thank you. And well, but my question was, is that taking place now? Yes, sir. Okay. It is uh, as of January first mm -hmm. of, of January first. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mayor. I'm sorry. Did anybody have any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Mr. Bates. Go ahead, sir. Um, thank you for the report. Um, I just want to make sure that we all understand that we do know there is a, you said, a large disproportionate number of African-American stop, traffic stops than there are other races, correct? That's correct. And then at the same time, you're saying that the police are not racially profiling? No, we're not, we're not saying that. Uh, we are simply saying that um, our study and the data indicates that there's a disparate number of African Americans being stopped for traffic violations and for consent searches. Okay, that in itself does not mean racial profiling. All right, thank you. Mr. Harp. <clears throat> I just want to thank you gentlemen for your report tonight. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm collect some key takeaways that um, that, that I got out of your report is one data collection is an issue we know that and we need to work on that um, and then once we've collected the data based on one of your 24 recommendations we need to have a uh, systematic way of entering that and your recommendation was a a, a full-time employee to do that yes <clears throat> and then you identified communication as an issue that we need to work on based on the findings that you have and, and those are three areas that, that, I, that I just highlight, but, but, but three other positive areas that, that I saw in this was uh, the accreditation and the PERF and the standards, the national standards the police department is seeking to, uh, to apply to their, uh, to, uh, to their actions. Those were all very positive things that you found in your, in your uh, investigation. Is that correct? Well, it was actually found in the PERF study and the Khalil study. Um, we just verified that through their study. Okay. And then the implementation of a consent form, uh, that's a, certainly a positive piece that you highlighted. And then, and then finally, I think the, the biggest takeaway on positive things is the installation of the cameras on the patrol cars. Yeah. And you think that is a very, very good action on, on, on the, the yeah. department's behalf? Absolutely. There are two big positive things there, and um, that is the in-car cameras increase accountability you know it um, it shows what a police officer is doing if uh, someone accuses a police officer of whatever the camera shows whatever happened and there's also an audio mic on the police officer 
So that voice is captured in a recording. So if uh, a police officer cannot say that he did one thing when in fact he did another, uh, because there's accountability. A citizen can accuse a police officer of some kind of wrongdoing, but if that did not occur, once again, that's recorded. Um, and in addition to that, and, and, and some would say first and foremost, it's also a safety issue for police officers. Thank you. Mr. Fowler. Yes, sir. I just wanted to make sure that, that I heard correctly, because as I was listening to the presentation, it appears that the police department has already made several strong steps towards addressing the issue. Is that what, uh, did I hear that correctly from you? That's correct. Uh, even before we got started in the, in the um, study, the police department worked on some very positive steps. After uh, we had a dialogue with the police department, they implemented more positive steps. And uh, from all indications, they continue to be looking for positive steps and are willing to continue with making positive steps. So it sounds then still that the major issue is communication then, is that correct? That's a big problem. Communications is a problem. Uh, there's a misunderstanding between the police and the community. And I'll have to reiterate, the numbers are what they are and they need to be dealt with. Okay. Thank you. Is that it, sir? Ms. Chris. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Commander Kennedy, uh, Chief Wilson. We'll get to you in just uh, you, a One of your recommendations was that's for okay, a signed fine. consent form. Uh, having learned that that's already in force now, did you have occasion today to examine that consent form that's being used? Yes, sir, I have a copy. And you like what you see? Or? I do, and I, I, I made the comment earlier that they took two forms and made them into one. And it's uh, very, very easy to use for the officer. It provides a lot of information, race and sex of the driver, for example, uh, that, that's very useful upon supervisory review. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Mr. Massey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, based upon what I've heard thus far, I just want to be, be sure that uh, I understand what I think I've heard. Um, was that, uh, let's see, who was given the bulk of that report? Mr. Wilson? Yes, he gave the bulk of it, Mr. Massey. Mr. Wilson did. Uh, did Mr. Wilson indicate that uh, he said that uh, racial profiling may or may not exist based on the data that he had at his disposal? Uh, no, sir. I, I did not say that. We had Dr. Quimby do a qualitative analysis and a part of that qualitative analysis that was the comment that he made and it was not necessarily based on the data it was based upon the information received during the interviews and the information provided to him about the statistical data but you did say that it may or may not exist is that correct that's what the report from dr quimby indicates Okay, the other question would be particular as it would, would relate to uh, information being sent to Raleigh. Should someone in the uh, uh, chain of command be accountable who is a sworn law enforcement officer before that data leaves uh, FPD and goes to Raleigh? Yeah, yes, sir. That was uh, very, very much uh, a part of our recommendation that you've got a, a data entry person that's supervised by a mid-management police employee Wearing a uniform. Okay. Um, first of all, I do want to thank you all. The report, based upon the information which you have, appears to be as thorough as it can be from this uh, vantage point. But the only thing that does concern me is that have okay. You feel as though uh, uh, that uh, with us being approved by Kalia, that we are on the right path toward trying to be able to answer the question whether or not we do or do not have uh, racial profiling? Well, uh, no, sir. And uh, okay. let, let me just explain that. The Thank you. The CALEA process involves a comparison of the policies and procedures of the Fayetteville Police Department with national standards. And when that comparison was done, the report indicates that the Fayetteville Police Department
policies are in compliance with national standards. And uh, their report did not deal specifically with racial profiling. Uh, they mentioned it, but they didn't get into the nuts and bolts of it and give an explanation of it. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for the uh, work and the report that you have delivered to us at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Massey. Any other questions? I get everybody here. Okay. I guess we'd like to entertain a motion to accept the report. Is that uh, the desire of council? Someone would make that motion. I move. Thank you, Mr. Chris. For a second. I second it. Thank you, sir. Any discussion on the motion? Let me ask for your vote, please. Mr. Massey. Uh, yes. Thank you, Katie. Mr. Hare. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for your report tonight, sir, and thanks for being here for our questions. And were we to have some additional questions after we review the 110 pages, can we contact you, sir? With us? Absolutely. You have our contact numbers. Uh, please feel free to call us. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. Motion to adjourn. So